and it's on T10, the patient have, will have paraplegia of upper motor neural lesions. Um, and then we do the reflexes. The reflexes with upper motor neuron is higher low. Wake up. Hi. And the plantar response. And the plantar response. Now, if we do the plantar response, we look at the big toe and the other few little toes. So, and we go from the lateral side slowly and firmly upwards. And what happens if we have an abnormal plantar response? Normal plantar response is flexion. And an abnormal plantar response is an extensive plantar response, which means the big toe goes up, the other toe spread, and the knee and the hip flexes. That's part of the reflex, the, hip, the knee and the hip flexes. So if somebody's got paraplegia, and they you try to examine them and they say, oh, but I can't move my legs at all. Now you do the Babinski and here the patient pulls his leg away. It's part of the Babinski reflex. It's not that the patient is faking his symptoms. Okay. Right. With lower motor neuron, the tone is low. The power has a distribution. If you look from anterior one cell, the commonest problem of an anterior one cell disease is motor neuron disease, and they have a mixture of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron sites, so we're not going to go there now. And then in the peripheral nerve, what is the distribution of weakness in the peripheral nerve? If you have a peripheral neuropathy, what is the distribution of weakness? Glove and stop distally in the limbs. So they've got distal, the feet start first, the, the feet are weak, the hands get weak later, and the patient's got a stocking glove sensory loss. That is a peripheral neuropathy pattern. Lower motor neuron lesions are more diffuse. Okay. And if somebody's got, um, say this patient is, this patient with a peripheral neuropathy, he's been taking a bottle of uh, brandy every day for the last three years. Now he comes to you and he's got painful burning feet. And when you examine them, he's got a stocking glove sensory loss and he's a little bit weak in his feet and his hands. That is a peripheral neuropathy picture. And there's lots of reasons for that. Now this patient comes to you, says he cannot uh, comb his hair, he cannot reach for something on the shelf, but he can continue with his work as a teacher, he can write and so on. If he sits on a chair, he struggles to stand up, but if he's up, he can walk and he's got a waddling gait. So his distribution of weakness is proximally in the arms, not being able to reach for something, not being able to stand up, but walking is fine. That is a myopathy. And this is a neuropathy. And then in between the muscle and the, the nerve and the muscle we have the neuromuscular junction. Hey, how do they look? Neuromuscular junction problems, the prototype. There is my stinger gravis. Okay. Are you awake still? <laughs> right. So, my stinger gravis, they have eye signs. Okay. So, they get tired through the day and they get ptosis through the day and they get double vision through the day. And they can get facial weakness and they can get swallowing weakness, the neuromuscular junction problem. If you examine them and you do the neck flexion and you do it again and again and again, they will fatigue. If you do the deltoid power and you do it again and again and again, they will fatigue. So that's what you will need to do, demonstrate. And sometimes if it's long standing, they also have proximal weakness. But they always, 90% of them have eye signs. Okay, or in the history or in the acute. Okay, so that is lower motor neuron. They've got low tone, they've got atrophy very quickly, the neuropathy specifically, and um, the distribution of weakness is either proximal or distal, or they fatigue, and then the reflexes. With the neuropathy, they have no reflexes. 
Myopathy's reflexes are very usually normal, unless it's very long standing, then the reflexes also go away. And uh, <coughs> you might see how the reflexes can fatigue. You do it now and then you do it again and then it gets smaller and smaller. Okay, so to distinguish between these two, we do the motor examination. Okay. So, if we examine somebody, we don't want them to be uncomfortable. You don't expose the patient uh, ever to other people. If you examine them, that's fine. But cover as much as you can while you do that. Okay. You're supposed to expose a patient or to undress a patient when you examine them. But usually we, we take a sheet and we cover the patient, especially females. We cover them from here and we cover them in between the legs like so, so that you can see that, thank you very much, so that you can see the muscles of the legs, but uh, everything is closed. Right. I love this blanket. It was here last year as well. <laughs> yes, I remember the blanket. Okay. So, patients usually lie like this. Yeah, they usually lie with their arms like so. So you don't have to um, reposition the patient. If the patient is lying down, you examine them in the lying position. If the patient in the exam is sitting up, you do it in the sitting position. Okay. Right, so the first thing that we do is we look. So we look for... What do we look for in the motor examination? We look for atrophy. So where do we look for atrophy in the... Lungs, lungs. Deltoids, yes, but some women don't have deltoids, my dear. So we can look at the deltoid and you can compare the deltoid on this side with the deltoid on the other side. But what is exposed already? The hands. So where do you look? And it's already at the top. You look at the first dorsal interosseus. It's that one. If you put your thumb against your second finger like so, you will see that you have a first dorsal interosseus. She doesn't know about it, but you have a first or second <laughs> on both sides. <laughs> right, and you compare them. Right, so you look at the small hand muscles, you look at the dorsal dorsal interosseus there, and then you look at the hypothenar muscle, must supposed to be round there, and the thenar muscle. I don't know how to show them. The thenar muscle, it's supposed to make a, a bulge. Okay. And you compare with the other side. So the first also interosseous is there. Hypothenar is nice and rounded. Thenar is nice and rounded. Okay. Then you can look at the forearms. You can look at the biceps and the deltoid if you want to. And you want to compare both sides. But the first thing that you see, the first also interosseous. In the legs, we have the tibialis anterior. That's the easiest one that we can see. So, usually, if you have um, in your thighs, you've got a quad that makes a bubble above the knee. Okay. As soon as it starts or it's level or it sinks in, you've got atrophy of the quads. Compare with both sides. In the lower limb, you've got your tibia there, you can feel it. But if you stand, you'll be able to feel that the tibia, on the side of the tibia, on the other side, there's a muscle called tibialis anterior. So, if you, if you ride the leg straight and you go like so, then where the muscle is the biggest, usually two thirds from the bottom. You're supposed to get the muscle before you get the bone. Same on the other side. Okay, so you can see. If you see the bone before you see muscle, there's atrophy. Okay. Right, and then you've got a small little muscle here we call extensor digitorum brevis which doesn't impress me much. It's difficult to find it. Um, the biggest one that you must look for is to be honest with you. Okay. And then you don't only look for atrophy, you also look for abnormal posture. If somebody is lying like so, it's an abnormal posture, you must note it. Okay. Or if somebody is moving his arms but he's not moving his legs at all and he's got a catheter in and a nasogastric tube and a drip, you must note those things. Okay. The guy that presented yesterday noted them very nicely. All the things that was, all the devices that we have touched to patients. 
Right, so abnormal posture, you must know that. Okay, next thing is the tone, eh? You guys always remember about fasciculations. Fasciculations are rare. They are rare. But if somebody comes with a slowly progressive history of weakness and starts struggling to swallow, and he's got tongue fasciculations, you must look for fasciculations in the rest of the body. But I want you to remember atrophy and abnormal mm -hmm. posture. Right. Then the toe. Toe. Uh, right. So how do we do toe in the arms? You put your finger on the biceps tendon. Actually, I did it the wrong way. And I, 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 I should have just walked around the other side. Never mind. So you take the, the biceps tendon. If you put your finger on the biceps tendon, and you flex and extend the arm. And you do it fast, and the patient must relax. Then you do pronation and supination. It's a fast movement. And then you turn the wrist. Okay. Let's turn the other side. Uh, this is a very... If you learn to examine from one side of the bed, you can't do it the other way around. And I will try. <laughs> so you... Mm -hmm. You flex and extend your arm. The patient must relax completely. Flex and extend your arm. And you feel if it hooks. If somebody's spastic, it, it hooks before you open it completely. It's a, quite a fast move. So if you feel a catch, we call it spasticity. A jackknife. It's a catch for the jackknife. Spasticity goes with that. So if you do tone, you must feel if the, if the, if the tone is high or not. If the tone is high, you must decide if it's spastic or rigid. Spastic is an upper motor neuron sign. Rigidity goes with basal ganglia disease like Parkinson's disease. Okay. So doing tone is very important. It helps you to distinguish upper and lower motor neurons, especially if the patient is not cooperative. Then you can go on your tone and your reflexes if somebody is comatose. Yeah. So flexion and extension. Pronation and supination is take the patient like by the hand like you're going to greet him and you supinate and pronate. Now, the pronators are the ones that get stiff first. This is the anatomic position. This is pronation and this is supination when you take the soup out of the pot. It's supination. So if you supinate somebody, the pronators will catch. Okay. So what you do is you supinate, and then you will feel it, it, it hooks. That is the pronator catch. It's an upper motor neuron sign. And then you take the wrist, and you turn the fingers. You take the fingers and you turn the wrist. That is the tone in the upper left. Right. So if you find the catch, it is associated with high tone, it is. Spasticity. Spasticity is an upper motor neuron sign. If you if you don't get any spasticity and you take the old man who shuffled into your room and you turn his wrist like so, it goes like tick, 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 tick. and if you're not sure, you say please make a fist with that hand and then you will feel it better. It will enhance the rigidity. If it stiff through the whole movement, we call it rigidity. If there's a catch in the movement, it's spasticity. Okay. Now in the legs. <coughs> Alright, so where do we look for atrophy? <laughs> Quads, tibialis, anterior, extensor, digitonal hairs. The next, will you shift up a little bit, please? You're too tall for my bed. Because you don't want the heels to hook at the bottom of the bed there, yeah. hey? It will influence your, it will make a, a, a jerk and then you think it's spastic when it's not. You have to relax. <laughs> so we ask the patient to relax. And then we move uh, them to see what happens. If the foot is flopping a little bit like that, it's normal. Okay, so you just relax. Put your hands on the both sides of the knee. You turn it and you see what happens. And then you pull the leg up. Usually, normally, the foot drags on the bed. Okay. Do the other side. You roll. We call it the rock and roll. You roll and you pull. Roll and pull. Okay. 
rock and roll. And then you take, sometimes patients are anxious or they want to help you and when you do this, they pick up the leg. And then you don't know, are they spastic or are they just helping you? Then you take the, the ankle by the one hand and, and you put your other hand on the knee and you flex the leg and you move it in different directions so that the patient doesn't know where you go. <laughs> and you compare it to the other side. See? Because you don't want the patient to tell the patient he's spastic when he's actually got normal tone or he's just nervous. That is tone. So you get two marks for that on your tick sheet. First the roll and the pull. The next thing is taking that and then moving it in different directions. That is tone. And we do this to distinguish upper motor neuron from lower motor neuron sides. Okay, very important. Don't skip it, right? Don't and skip your system. First you look, then you feel the tone, then you do the power. If you don't do it that way, you jump around. And then you waste your time. You've only got five minutes in the fourth year. Right. So now if you've rolled and pulled, just relax your leg. If you rolled and pulled, and you've taken the ankle and you've bent the leg, you put the ankle down and you do clonus. So, for the first thing is, the first thing is the knee must be bent. Okay? The second thing is the ankle re rests on the, uh, the heel. The heel rests on the bed. And then you take the foot and you lift it off the bed. And then you see somebody's got clonus. If somebody's got clonus, it goes like so. Okay. So you relax, you put it up, keep it there. And you can do it a few times, because sometimes if you just change the ankle, the angle of the knee, you can get clonus. Obviously we don't expect it in a healthy volunteer. <laughs> Okay, but do the clonus right after you've done turn, otherwise you're going to forget. Right, so we've looked at normal posture and atrophy, we've done the turn in the arms, flexion and extension, pronation and supination, and we've turned the wrist in the legs, we've done the rock and roll, we've taken the foot, we've moved the leg, we don't do turn in the ankle, it's a stiff joint, okay, we don't do turn in the ankle. And then we do clonus after we just put that ankle down while we've still got the hand under the, under the knee and we check for clonus. Next is power. You guys have to practice this. If you demonstrate it, it looks easy. But if you don't practice it at home on somebody else, you're going to forget. Okay, right. So with the motor examination, we always test the muscle in action. Right. Test the muscle in action. And we test one joint at a time. So I want to see if you examine the patient that you are testing the muscle in action and you're testing only one joint. So if I say, and then we grade power, right? Why we do that? The power. Power is from zero, which is nothing, to five, which is normal. One, two, three, four, five. Where do we start to grade power? We start in the middle. We ask against gravity. Against gravity only. Okay. This is against gravity and against resistance but it's not normal. This is normal. If a patient can lift it, not lift against gravity, you test the joint with gravity excluded. And one, there's a flicker of movement, but it doesn't move the joint. Okay. So, uh, uh, how do we create power? From zero to five, it's an Oxford scale. So, five is normal power just like yours. <coughs> zero is nothing. We start in the middle with three. So we ask, can you lift up your hands like so? And then we already know that the patient had a hemiplegia or not. Okay? 
So we've got three out of five that are there immediately. Then we say, okay, and you do this. And we start from the deltoid and we move downwards. Right, so this is the first thing. And then we ask, we, you use your uh, leverage, okay? So hold it strong and then you try to pull it down. And put your weight behind it. If you're little, weight is just, power is just weight with the direction. So <laughs> okay, so I'm very strong today. And the deltoid is there, it's in action, and I resist. Right, that's the deltoid. Adduction, we ask, I don't do adduction, it's uh, too much for me. But you have together and you try to push it away. So, abduction of the shoulders, we're testing the joints, hey. Abduction of the shoulder is C5. Adduction of the shoulder, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, so we're testing six, seven, and eight down, down the line. So it's, I don't think it's that important. Here's a make like this. All right. Now you want it 90 degrees, eh? Then it's fair to him and to me. So you say pull towards you and stabilize yourself on a on a proximal, more proximal joint. So pull towards you. Okay. Push away. Push. There. So now we say, okay, put your arm here. Push away now. Nice, no, weak. We didn't do it right. You need to have more <coughs> in action. There we go. Now pull, push, push, push. Very strong again. Pull towards you. Very strong. And, and don't play. No? You want to taste the power. No? Well, they don't want to be nice. And then the other hand, put this one down. Pull towards you. Push straight. Sometimes I hold it there. Push straight. Then I kind of got more control of where the joint goes. Okay? Flexion, pull towards you. Extension, push away. If I touch this for flexion, I touch the flexor area. So pull towards you. And if I say push away, that's what I do. If I do this and I say pull, the patient doesn't always understand. Okay? So use your non level communication. Right. Now to it, C5, 6, 7, and 8. 5, 6, 7, 8. Next joint is the wrist. Okay, so stabilize the wrist. So that I know when you have a bit, don't do this. Hold, hold your wrist. Hold your wrist. Which joint am I tasting? <laughs> Not one. I'm tasting more than one. So hold the wrist and say, hold your fist up. Keep it there. Hold it down. Keep it there. That is wrist flexion and extension. This is flexion. This is extension. <coughs> Anatomic position. Flexion and extension. So this is six and seven. Right. Now I move my hand on. Straight fingers. This is seven and eight. Straight fingers hold there, and we go approximately there with one finger. Hold it strong. <coughs> And for finger flexion, don't do this. How do you test finger flexion like this? So take, take my fingers, hold them, hold them. There we go. That is finger flexion straight. Okay? Put your two fingers from the thumb side, put in the palm, and ask the patient, the patient to hold your finger. And the last one is the there, the interossier. Open your fingers, keep them open. Keep them open and also proximally. Do this with your one hand and try to squeeze it with the other hand. Close it up. You can close it if you really want to, but you want you just want to feel the tone. Open your fingers. Open your fingers. There you go. Right. So what is this? G1. Okay. Right, so let's just go through the arms again. <coughs> Um, <coughs> shoulder abduction is C5. Remember that your brachial plexus is from C5 to T1, so it must fit in, in between those. Eh? So shoulder abduction is C5. Elbow flexion is 5, 6, and extension 7 and 8. Wrist 6 and 7. Fingers, seven and eight. 
and abduction of the fingers is T1. The legs we start with L2, because we've got two legs. And for the hip, for the hip, we go like this. We've got uh, uh, the hip, like a hip here. Oh, where's the hip? There's the hip. And we've got the knee. And we've got the ankle. Okay. <coughs> so for the hip, hip flexion and extension, we start with L2. And we've got four digits for the hip. For the knee, L3, 4, 5, and there's one. And for the ankle, L4, 5, there's one, there's two. That is easier to remember, okay? So for the hip, we start with L2. For the knee, we start with L3. For the ankle, we start with L4. And we just go on. L2, 3, 4, 5, this one is two. And the forward movement is the first two digits. Right. So you ask the patient, the muscle in action. If we do this, lift up your leg. I'm stronger than he is. Go and do this, lift up your leg. Say, so lift up your leg. Muscle must be in action. And if we do this, we're not just testing one joint at a time. Okay, so lift up your leg, keep it up there, hold it strong, testing only hip flexion. Right, put it down, other side, lift it up, hold it there, hip flexion. That is L2, 3. Right. Now if we say L4, 5 is for hip extension. Hey. So, we ask the patient, keep your leg on the bed, don't let me lift it up. Okay, so this little space under your ankle there is just for your fingers to put your fingers in there. And you say, keep your leg on the bed, and you try to lift it Okay, so this is the extension. Two, three, four, five. Right. And usually if the patient does his best, you lift the leg, other leg up as well. So that's the sign that we try to do. That is, so I've got normal power and did this best. Let me just get my hand up here. Okay, down again. Oh, hold it strong on the bed. And there we go. So we see next. So now I told you to only test one joint at a time. How can I then do the ankle there? Because it gives me more leverage and the knee cannot move backwards. That's why I'm using that space under the ankle there. Okay. Inflection, hip extension. One joint at a time in action. Now for the knee, you can't test power of the knee unless you bend the knee. Okay, so you bend the knee first and you support the knee at the bottom and you say, can you lift up your foot? Lift up your foot. Okay, pull towards you. Pull towards you. There we go. So out. Three, four. It's the forward, first two digits is the forward movement. Okay, push straight again. Three, four, pull towards you. Five, this one. So on the other side. Bend your knee. Pull towards you. Push straight. Right. I usually do flexion first because it's easier for me. You can do it any way you like as long as you practice and you know what you're doing. Lift up the toes. Both toes. So ankle in action. Right? Eh? Joint must be in action. Keep lift it up. Hold it up. Hold it up, step down, step down, see I support the proximal area. <coughs> now I just say step down, what joint are you testing? And I'll ask you that in the exam. If I say what joint are you testing, you must know something is wrong. <laughs> okay, so one joint at a time, muscle in action. So what I did the same with the elbow flexion. So Pull towards you, I touch the flexor area. Push away, I touch the extensor area. And if somebody's very strong, you shouldn't have to put your shoulder behind it. Okay, and now we must still do the reflexes. Showing this hammer. There's no <laughs> new <motivated> <laughs> days. The hammer is real. Okay, it's better. Okay. So if we do the reflexes, are you still awake? <laughs>
Everybody that was sleeping will stand up quickly. Guys, please wake up the person next to you if you see them starting to play at all. Let's go. You should put kind things to you. We need some more coke. Mm. Right. Everybody wake? You know, if you, you don't know when you're sleeping, you know. <laughs> Alright. So the reflexes. That's the last thing that we do with the motor exam. So. You, the patient is lying like this. Don't fiddle with the arms. Just put your thumb on the biceps tendon or your finger, your pointing finger, and you hit on your finger. So the smaller the rubber is, the smaller it is on your finger. And usually you stay on the same side, but I want to stretch over him now. Right. So what you usually do, you don't run around the bed usually, okay? Stay on the same side, the bed is usually against the wall. So you reflex this to this side, and you do on the other side. So that is C, five. Now, brachioradialis is C, six. Right, so where is the brachioradial reflex? It's on the thumb side, on the radius, five centimeters above the wrist, on the radius. This guy doesn't have reflexes. <laughs> it's normal not to have reflexes. Okay, some people don't have reflexes. And then, it's the first time that you mobilize the arms. You pull the arm over the patient's body so that he can relax. You can't, cannot do reflexes in the active arm. The patient must be relaxed. Okay. So you pull it over the patient so that you can see the olecranon process and about the thumb above the olecranon process. You do... The reflex. Same on the other side. Reflex. C5, C6, C7. C5, C6, C7. Biceps break your right arm, triceps reflex. Okay. And in the knees, you have to flex both the knees, both the knees over your arm. And you don't look at the ankle, you look at the muscle that you're going to do. Hey, it's an up there. So you feel where the tendon is, and you hit the tendon. And the other side is well. So if the patient doesn't have reflexes, you ask him, can you gnash your teeth as soon as I say, gnash, then you do that. I say, do it now. Yeah, you've got the reflex. Relax, do it again. Relax, bite again. <laughs> All right, so if somebody doesn't have reflexes, you have to enhance them. So you take, um, you take their attention off what they're doing. If you're doing the arm reflexes, you ask the patient to lash. You can do it with the legs as well, or you can ask the patient to pull his hands. That's something that you can see. Okay, it's pulling now, then you do the reflex. Relax, pull, do the reflexes. Okay. So you can't really say somebody doesn't have reflexes unless you enhance. Okay, let's just see if I enhance, if he gets a reflex. Okay. Bite on your teeth, relax, bite again. Nope, no reflexes. <laughs> right. Okay, now you, for the ankle reflex, uh, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't put the leg on the other leg. Okay? If somebody is very spastic, the leg just extends the whole time and you spend two minutes trying to get the one leg over the other leg. And you don't have that much time. So what you do is you flex the ankle and the knee. Just like that. Right? And then you tense the ankle just a little bit. And then you bite on your team. There you go. That's how you do ankle reflexes. Ankle reflexes are the most difficult to do in my experience. So then you put the leg back, bend the other one. The person must just relax. You just don't, don't overextend the ankle because then you'll kill the reflex, okay? So you just stretch the ankle a little bit. 90 degrees is fine. And he's got killer stender. And he's got ankle reflexes. Usually we struggle with the ankle reflex, not with the arms. In this case, we're struggling with arms and ankle reflexes up there. When you stop at the ankle, you do the plantar response. This is a little bit sharp. Okay, so 
I'm going to scratch the bottom of your foot. Right. So we go from the bottom, we go slowly and firmly, and up. Outside of the foot, slowly, firmly, <coughs> and up. Some people are ticklish, then you have to do it a different way. And you go behind the lateral malleolus, and the, ex the, the reaction is the same. If it's uh, abnormal, the big jaw will extend, the other toes will spread, and the patient will flex. Okay, so you test the muscle in action, just one joint at a time. Touch the flexion, flexors if you, flexion aspect if you want the patient to flex. Touch the extension aspect if you want the patient to extend. Reflexes C5, C6, C7. We can't keep them in hands. L3 to the knee, S1 is the ankle reflex. Right. Um, if you examine the patient from the top to the bottom, joint for joint, that you will be able to get to these patterns of halves, halves, proximal or distal distribution of weakness, and you will be able to make an anatomic diagnosis. Hey. Right. I will just uh, include that there is something missing between T1 and L2. What is that? What can we test between T1 and L2? <coughs> okay. So if the patient is weak in his legs, so you want to see what the highest level is. If the arms are fine and the legs are weak, you must ask the patient to cross over his arms and try to sit up. And then you look at what happens to the navel. If somebody's got a T10 level, Somebody's got a T10 level. The T10 level is about the navel, the navel height. If somebody's got weakness from T10 downwards and they try to sit up, the navel will pull upwards because the muscles at the top are still strong and nothing is opposing the action. So if the navel pulls up, So, there's the tricky sternum and the pelvis and the navel. You ask the patient to fold their hands and sit up, the navel will move upwards. And it's because the patient has got a T10 level. And it's called the B-ball side. Okay. So, if the patient is paraplegic, you must look for the abdominal muscles. Because if you know the hands are fine, T1, and the legs are not, you have to go for the highest level because that's the level you want the MRI on. Okay. Right. That was the most examination.